So dating, uh, just to be clear, dating as in chronology, what you see here are a range of ways people uh, tell time in past and present. Now in archeology, span there are two basic types of dating, relative and absolute. Relative dating, I am older than the person who's filming me right now. Fenway Park, home of my beloved Boston Red Sox, is older than me. The Coliseum in Rome is older than Fenway Park. No, no numbers involved here. Relative dating just lines things up before and after. Doesn't give specific differences between them. Does not give any absolute age, absolute time difference. Everything is relative, floating, not fixed at a specific point in time. Now, absolute dating, on the other hand, is when an actual chronological date is assigned to something. This is also called chronometric dating. I am 52, Michael is? 44. 44, right. Fenway Park was opened in 1912 CE, the Coliseum in 80 CE. So you see the difference? Now, why might you need such fixed dates, fixed points? You need absolute dates to get a sense of just how much time divides two past events or past monuments, and thereby to see how quickly or how slowly things change between those two points. And that's something relative dating cannot tell you. Am I old enough to be Michael's mother? We would need absolute dates to verify that hideous and obviously incorrect concept. Now, how are absolute dates expressed? Uh, in the West, the standard was uh, for a long time to use BC, before Christ, or AD, Anno Domini, year of our Lord. Now, these are terms not necessarily meaningful to many peoples. The Islamic calendar, uh, conversely, dates from the Prophet Muhammad's departure from Mecca to Medina, which equates to AD 622. Now, in recent years, a more neutral archaeological and historical terminology has been advocated. BCE, before the Common Era, and CE, Common Era. And that is what I'll use here, though you are going to hear varying terminologies throughout the class. Let's talk a bit more about relative dating. Uh, one way to establish a relative chronology is through stratigraphic excavation. We've talked already about the principle of stratigraphic succession, the law of superposition. The lower you go, the older you get, unless... Yes, unless you see signs of interference from formation processes. Through excavation, we can say what is older than what by the relative position of finds though you can't say from stratigraphy alone how much older it is. It isn't as if uh, if something is just a little bit below something else, it's just a little bit older, or if a whole lot below, it's a whole lot older. Sadly, it doesn't work that way. Sadly, it ain't that easy. Now, it isn't just a matter of where you find things, but what you find and how you treat your finds. One of the first thing archaeologists will do after they've recovered their material is to classify the objects, divide them into meaningful categories. Pots versus lithics versus coins uh, versus mud brick, you know, whatever. Uh, this is called making a typology. Basically, this involves the classification of artifacts into types on the basis of certain similarities. Now, one thing to understand about typologies is there is no one way to do it. There are as many different typologies as there are archaeological questions. So there's no right or wrong way, but some are definitely more useful than others. It makes more sense to put pots in one category and coins in another and mud brick in another than to say, okay, things bigger or smaller than a bread basket. Typologies begin to allow us to control the finds we make, make some sense of a group of objects. One of your archaeological exercises will offer you the chance to do just this kind of analysis. You might be thinking though, what does making a typology have to do with dating? Well, one general feature, a cross-cultural feature of human life is that artifact styles change through time. Pots, jewelry, clothing, whatever, all change in design through time. It's strange but true that it is very rare for things to remain unchanged over long periods. All right, I want you to think of something that has not developed, has not changed at all. It doesn't look all that different from your parents' time to your own. Think about that for a second. Now, what doesn't change in my world? Uh, pencils, 
Uh, toilets, in case you're wondering, I, that I came across that toilet doing intensive survey in Greece. Don't ask me what it's doing there. Uh, these are functional things, not glamorous things. Uh, money, too, tends to be quite traditional, doesn't tend to alter through time. What does change? Uh, think of clothes, cars, hairstyles, you know, things that are highly variable, things that are central to self-presentation. Now that takes us to the concept of seriation, the process of lining things up. Seriation is a relative dating method, and it involves arranging archaeological materials into a sort of a presumed chronological sequence based on cultural and stylistic change. Now, as long as items are gathered from the same cultural tradition, archaeologists assume that stylistic change occurs relatively gradually over time. So by tracing similarities and differences in style, and by measuring the relative popularities of these differing styles, one can reconstruct a relative sequence. You see here Ford's Model T to Ford's latest model uh, and all the steps in between. You can, get, you can develop a sort of a sense of progression. So forever after, if you dig up a car, this provides a way uh, without having to dig up a car just above it or just below it. It allows you a way to say roughly where it lies in the chronological sequence. Is it closer to the Model T or closer to today's version? Won't tell you exactly the year of the car, but says where in the development of cars this example lies. Now, seriation is not, of course, perfect. Some styles come back, bell bottoms, retro fashions, but still, it's one relative dating technique. Now, sooner or later, however, in every archaeologist's life, there comes a time when you want a bit more than that. You're going to want some absolute or chronometric dates. Now, this might be an absolute, absolute date. Uh, what you see here happening, 24 August, AD 79, well, Pompeii. Or it might be slightly, you know, less specific, third quarter of the first century CE. Either way, absolute chronological dates pin things down. So how do you gate an absolute date on archaeological artifact or feature. Now, sometimes the artifact actually tells you. Uh, some lucky future archaeologist might find a time capsule. You see here one we buried at Brown, deliberately deposited, chock full of synchronic dated material. More likely, archaeologists might find coins, many of which one way or another can provide an outright date. Coins are sometimes called the excavator's best friend, for they provide one clear indication of the date of the stratum where it was found. And that helps us with what is both below and what is above. Now, two useful terms in all this, the concept of terminus antiquem, T-A-Q, and terminus postquem, T-P-Q. This is Latin. T-A-Q is the date before which a stratum, artifact, or feature must have been deposited, TPQ is the date after which a stratum, artifact, or feature must have been deposited. Let's say you're digging and you find a floor, and lying on the floor is a coin, a coin that dates to 43 BCE, the year after Julius Caesar's death. Nice coin there decorated with the daggers that killed him. Well, that provides a nice TAQ for the floor. The floor had to be there before the coin could be put on it. The floor dates before 43 BCE. Caesar could have stood on it. If the coin lay below the floor, however, then that gives you a TPQ, a date after which the feature was deposited. That is, the coin came before the floor and Caesar was never there. Useful concepts, though I tend to get them backwards, so you better check me on it. <laughs>